So first we're going to talk about weeds and then diseases and then insects. Um, weeds will be probably about half of it and then we're just going to hit the majority of the diseases and the majority of the insects that you see um, within the turf system. So what is a weed? A plant out of place, a plant growing where it is not wanted. Is fescue a weed? Yeah, exactly. You know, Bermuda is a weed if it's in fescue. So it's whatever undesirable species. An oak tree can be a weed as well. You know, anything can be a weed. I really like this definition from my old advisor and, and professor at NC State. We also have a, a definition from the Weed Science Society of America. So we get together once a year all of us across the United States, and we talk very boring research projects about how to kill weeds. And of course, we have our own definition. But I really like Dr. York's definition because he put in there, it interferes with human activities. Because in turf, that's our issue. We're interfering with human activities, whether it's safety, whether it's aesthetics. It's not like row crops. In row crops, why are weeds bad in row crops? Hurts the yield. And when you hurt the yield, you hurt how much money you're making. Your productivity goes down. Well, in turf, we don't really care about yield. We don't really care how much it grows, how fast it grows. Sometimes a lot of people like it to grow slower so they don't have to mow as much. But it's aesthetics is probably the biggest one that we see. This is annual bluegrass in a creeping bent grass putting green. And think I think it looks neat. But what this is this is like research heaven right here. I think it looks neat, but it's a disruption of turf uniformity. We always seem to think that it has to be uniform, you know, all the way across, whether it be mown high, mown low, whatever it is, but a uniform color as our foundation of our landscape. But there's a lot of other things that go into it. If Tiger Woods had to put on this, he would probably withdraw because his back hurts. Not because... His back hurts, but because that ball, when it rolls across that putting green, is not going to roll true. It's going to play plinko across it. When you have weeds in there, now you're taking nutrients from the other plants. There was a study done in Tennessee on athletic fields. The more weeds you have, the more hazardous and more injuries occurred on athletic fields. Because weeds typically grow in compacted soils, turf doesn't grow in compacted soils. So you have more hard, compacted areas, children fall. Children break their, you know, their ankles, they hit their heads. So it's a safety issue. Has anybody ever heard of goat head or puncture vine? That on a playground is a disaster. If you have puncture vine on a playground, kids are coming in with cuts and scrapes because they're rolling around in the grass, they're rolling around in these weeds in these areas. There are also vines out there, tripping, falling. So they're hazardous things, not just aesthetic. There's ball play that comes in with it, but there's a lot of other things with safety as well. But the first thing you have to do is identify what weed you got. If you misidentify weed, you're down, now you're on the wrong path and you're gonna have the wrong control measure, and then you're gonna be the first one to blame your control measure that it didn't work. When in reality, we didn't identify the weed first, to really attack the issue at hand. So there's a lot of reasons why you identify. You're gonna indicate a cultural problem. Weeds actually talk to you. They're telling you something that's going on underneath the soil that you can't see. Whether it be low fertility, too much water, too dry, too much, well shade you can see, but a lot of other things. Annuals versus perennials. If you identify your weed correctly, you can identify, then you can go to a book and say, all right, this is the annual. Annuals, they're better controlled with pre-emerge herbicide. Variation in response to herbicides. Crabgrass and goosegrass, they look very, very, very similar. There are a lot of chemicals out there. There are a lot of control measures out there that will control only crabgrass and not goosegrass and vice versa. So if you misidentify it, your variation, your herbicide or your control measure is not going to work. Life cycle, flowering, dandelions. When do you treat dandelions? Sometimes you just treat them whenever you see them because that's all option you got. When they're yellow, I'm going to leave you lingering on that one then. But there's a difference in timing when it's flowering or not flowering or early in the year or late in the year, depending on with the same control measure, but just timing during the year. 
This is my favorite. Impress your friends and neighbors. You know, if you become the person that can identify weeds, people will come to you because everybody has weeds. Everybody does. But most importantly, save time and money. Misidentifying, you're going to have the wrong control measure. Then you're going to waste your time and waste your money on something that doesn't work. So identifying it is really, really, really important. What do we have here? They're different weeds, but they look just about identical. So misidentifying could be really easy by just, just a glance at the weed. What you have is green foxtail, and you also have little barley. They're both grassy weeds. They're both annuals. If you look at it, they're both grasses. They're both annuals. One is a warm season. One is a cool season. They both can be treated with pre-emerge herbicides. But if you do it at the wrong time, you will not get control. So that's why it's really important you identify that weed correctly. Same control measure, different time of the year. You will or will not get control of that weed. I like this. This is probably the funnest part of weed control. It's going to tell you something that's going on, and it's going to lead you in a long-term weed control solution. Not Band-Aids, but year after year, you're strengthening the health of your turf, which is going to outcompete weeds because something might be going on that you might not know. Flooded soils. Talked about yellow nut sedge earlier a little bit in flooded soils, but not weed. If you have a very uniform stand, typically, of these types of weeds, something's going on. Now, I'm not saying if there's one weed here, one weed there, then it's a flooded soil. But yellow nut sedge and not weed will grow in flooded soils, but turf will not. I see this all the time next to driveways and all the time next to sidewalks. You walk on it and indents the soil where people get in out of their car, the water gets in there and it stays in there, the turf doesn't grow, and then knotweed and yellow nut sedge show up. Nut sedge always in drainage ditches on the side of the road. I call yellow nut sedge a 70 mile an hour weed. You can be driving 70 miles an hour and you can see yellow nut sedge sticking up in a yard. It is so fast growing. You can mow your yard one day, the next day it's sticking right up. Moist and fertile soils. Clover is a great indicator of infertile soils. What does clover do that some other plants don't? What do soybeans do? Fertilizes the soil. This plant makes its own nitrogen. Okay? So if you're in an area that's under fertilized for turf, it loves it. It's not, enough, it's not enough fertility to maintain the turf, but it's the area now that under-fertilized, under-maintained, that now the, the uh, white clover can come in and go, go crazy. In row crops, if you fertilize soybeans, it stops making its own nitrogen. It confuses it. Same type of thing with white clover. If, it's low, if it is a low fertility area and you go out and you fertilize it, You've been low, so now you're getting to the adequate amount needed for the turf, but then you've confused that plant. It doesn't know whether to make it or not. And when you start messing with the biological system by just fertilizing a plant, it kind of dwindles away. You're now having survival of the fittest. The turf is going to be fitter and outcompete that because you've took something away from that, that yellow clover. Compacted soils. So let's go back here. Let's go real quick. What's long-term weed control solution for this? Flooded soil. Better drainage. It may be compacted too, airifying, getting that water out of the system. Maybe a broken irrigation head, you know, a leaky irrigation head. Yellow nut sedge can tell you if there's a, a break in the line somewhere too. What about this? Well, we already kind of talked about it. What would you do for long-term weed control with white clover? Fertilize, exactly. These are not Band-Aid fixes, and it's not going to fix it permanently, but it's going to help year after year after year by having a healthy turf stand. Compacted soils. Goosegrass loves compacted soils. Next to driveways, next to sidewalks. Most of the time when you're pulling in, a lot of people cut the corner of their driveway. They get just a little bit off. Goosegrass is going to be there way before your turf grows in those areas. What's long-term weed control for this? Airify. See this a lot on baseball fields, highly, highly trafficked areas where dogs are running in and out. 
this you're going to see you're going to see goose grass before your your other grass this is a walking path it was just covered on both sides of that walking path there is a lot of these out here not just the ones we covered acidic soils alkaline soils compacted and fertile high high fertile low fertile low mowing there's a bunch of them and so the weeds can tell you something you still may have to come out and at that point do something to get rid of it but if you maintain that cultural practice to keep a healthy turf then you're already a step ahead of everybody else and you're also putting less pressure on your alternative methods if you don't maintain the turf healthy by fertilizing irrigating and doing all that you're now putting more pressure on say a pre-emerge herbicide to work and when it fails will blame the pre-emerge herbicide instead of yourself for not maintaining the turf. The herbicides and those things are supposed to be applied in healthy systems. So the best weed control is a healthy, vigorous lawn. Weeds are the result of unhealthy turf, not the cause. Your turf doesn't look bad because you have weeds. You have weeds because you didn't maintain the turf correctly. So just remember that. Here's a perfect example of this. This is all crabgrass around here. This is a newly healthy established zoysia grass, properly watered, properly fertilized, and it is attacked from all sides of crabgrass, but there's none in there. So thick and healthy is the best thing you can do for weed control. And like I said, I won't go over this too much, proper fertility, irrigation, and mowing. Now our optimum mowing height, I did an entire study on mowing grass at different heights to see what the population is going to be of different weeds. We'll talk about one, crabgrass. Well, let me, let me go past this. Crabgrass. If you mow it at one inch of a tall fescue lawn, you're going to get about 65% crabgrass in that area. If you mow it at the proper mowing height, you're around 15%. If you did nothing else other than fertilize properly and water, water properly and mow at the correct height. Four inches, there's little to none. We don't like to recommend four inches for two reasons. One, you end up getting into uh, safety issues with lawnmowers. Most of the lawnmowers, push mowers, do not go above four inches. And when you get there, you start getting more disease problems. So then you start counteracting. Disease comes in, disease kills the grass, then comes the crabgrass. So it comes back in. But if you just mow properly, that is specific numbers that at three inches, you're gonna have less crabgrass in your area. Now, is it easier to get rid of 15% crabgrass or 60% crabgrass? And with crabgrass, it's going to germinate all year, you know, as, as long as the environment's right in the summertime. So if you put a pre-emerge herbicide down and you're trying to stop thousands of plants compared to four plants or five plants and it doesn't work, we're blaming the herbicide for not working, not maintaining the turf correctly. So. Here's what it looks like. You know, if you mowed it one inch on the top left, that is just predominantly crabgrass. Where if you look down on the bottom left, you only got one, two, three, or four plants. And that's with no herbicide. But that's with properly watered, properly maintained turf. Now what about Bermuda grass? We said we recommend mowing it, you know, two inches. But there's not really a big difference when it comes to crabgrass populations, is it? Why would that be? Bermuda grass, we can't grow at three inches. When we looked at the two inches of the fescue, it's unhealthy for it to grow because it wants to grow tall, right? This is the optimum mowing height for Bermuda, but you don't have enough canopy at two inches to really restrict it. So just knowing what turf you have too is also gonna influence your pressure on what herbicides or things that you're gonna apply. And these are increments at a half inch, half inch, one inch, one and a half and two. So you're not really gonna get that reduction with some of those species. And here's just an example of it. I won't go through it, but just to show that you're gonna get crabgrass if you have a turf that's mown at two inches or less. If, cause it's always there, no matter what. It's all, crabgrass is always in your lawn. Weed management, like I said, you definitely need to ID the turf and the weed, for example, the mowing height than the Bermuda grass, the mowing height than the fescue, you gotta know what turf you have, know what weeds you have. Once you do that, it, it leads you to determining what you, if it's an annual or perennial weed, 
and then it's going to tell you if it's a grassy weed or a broadleaf weed once you identify then that's going to tell you what you use broadleaf weeds post emergence typically do better annual weeds pre emergence typically do better and then gr perennial grassy weeds can you treat perennial weeds with the pre emerge herbicide what's an annual weed what is its life cycle or an annual anything yearly, yearly. how's it come back from seed so a pre-emerge herbicide stops that seed from emerging. All right. If you have a perennial, what's its life cycle? Forever. Forever. For, yeah. So it's going to come back year after year. How is it coming back? Roots, rhizome, stolen. Would a pre-emerge herbicide work on it? No. So correctly identifying is going to tell you. And so if you kind of know annual annual grasses stick with pre's you know perennials you're going to have to post emerge now what kind of you said you got to identify them so what kind of weeds do you have it's going to determine like i said which ones you use but we're going to split them up into three just individual categories broadleafs sedges and grasses broadleafs are going to have more broader leaves like now the veins are not going to be um, parallel, they're going to be more intertwined like an, like an oak leaf. Grasses and sedges are going to have parallel veins, different root systems. But in general, in general, those are going to be um, different herbicides that control all of those. But the trend now is when we go buy a herbicide, we want one to do all of it, right? We're just going to put everything we can and it's going to get rid of all the stuff I don't want and keep all the stuff that I want. And actually, this is happening. When you're buying something and it says broadleaf grassy weed control, no matter what it is, it's going to have different active ingredients that control those different type of weeds. So we think we got one huge hammer. But if you don't have grasses, why are we treating for grasses? If you don't have broadleafs, why are we treating for broadleafs? Same with the sedges. So reality, we have a lot of little hammers that fill our toolbox. Every time a herbicide has an extra ad ad active ingredient in it, it's the exact same thing as fertilizer. When the fertilizer goes up, number goes up. The more numbers on the bag, the more expensive it is. Because the active ingredient is what you pay for. So just remember that. If you don't have it, don't have to treat for it. Be site specific in what you do. If you don't have sedges in your yard, why buy a product that has an active ingredient that treats for sedges? And each of these costs different amount too, individually. You can pick which ones that work. So before we get into a lot of this, I like to go through the herbicide nomenclature. We've talked about pre's and post, but it's really important to know what they do, what they say on the bottle, what is on the bottle. Because there's a lot of different names for the same thing. What, ha what has happened in, in the past, very smart person makes this chemical in a lab. They realize this chemical works for herbicides. It may have worked for something else before. They patent that chemical. They package that chemical, and about 15 years later, it comes to market. Then you only got about 10 years before that patent expires. When that patent expires, anybody can use it, okay? So that's why now there is all sorts of different names for the same thing. What we want to do is look at that bottle so you know whenever you pick that bottle up, regardless of what the name brand is, you get the active ingredient or you get the product that you want to do the job. So I like to go through this. It's just called Herman Herbicides 101, and we just kind of look at a label. So for example, herbicide, herbicide nomenclature. The trade name is Trimac, or it can even be Weed Out. You go down here to this active ingredient label, and it's proponic acid, you got 2,4-D, you got dicamba. Those are going to be, for example, MCPA, that's the short one for that, but there's also dicamba and 2,4-D in that one. The common name, proponic acid, and then the chemical name, don't even worry about it. <laughs> this is for a chemist. They can take that plus R2, 2-methyl-4-chlorophenoxy 
and draw that chemical structure. It's required by law to be on the label, but that's just saying that there's two methyl groups turned to the right with four chlorines attached to this phenoxy, which is another chemical structure. That's all it is. Don't worry about it. The active ingredient and trade name are the ones that you really, really need to know. So quiz, what is the trade name? Roundup, what is the active ingredient? Glyphosate, exactly. All right, now what is other ingredients? Water. They won't tell you. Because that makes Roundup Pro Max Roundup Pro Max. They may have a detergent in there that helps it stick to the plant better that makes it rain fast. Glyphosate's also called Rodeo, but it has different other ingredients. It just makes it a little different from itself or from each other. It's not saying that one is better than the other certain situations. Yes, if you sprayed, for example, rodeo and then it rained right afterwards, you're probably not going to get the control because it washed off. If you sprayed Roundup Pro Max or Roundup Rain Fast and it rained right afterwards, you'll probably get more control because of the surfactant. You pay for that active ingredient, though. This is the meat and the potatoes right here or as I call it, breakfast in the South, okay? When you go order breakfast in the Southeast, you order bacon, sausage, biscuits. What shows up on the table? Grits, you didn't order it, but it's there. Some grits are good, some are absolutely horrible, okay? This is the grits. The other ingredients are the grits. It's what makes a good breakfast a good breakfast or a bad breakfast a bad breakfast but you still, got your, you still got your bacon, your sausage, and your biscuits. Hermicide nomenclature. So now you know what's on the label. We've already talked about this. So you have pre-emergence and post-emergence herbicide. Start with post-emergence. That just means you apply that herbicide after that plant is emerged. So it's actively growing, you spray it on it, it's a granular, and so then it kills it after it grows. Pre-emerge, you apply to the soil, not the plant, but you're applying it to the soil to prevent emergence. Does it kill seeds? Is it called pre-germinating or pre-emergence? Emergence. So what this plant or what this product does, you put it out, whether it's a liquid or a granular, it's always recommended that you water it in. Once you, because you don't want it on the leaf tissue, you want it on the soil. So you water it in, it tells you your restrictions within 24 hours or 72 hours, how much water to put on it. And when it hits that soil, it stops. It does not go anywhere. It does not move anywhere. It sticks right there on that soil surface. So then you have your weed, it's sitting there on the soil surface. Then you have your weed seeds. It says, oh, yay, I got enough sunlight, enough temperature, say crabgrass. And it starts to germinate. You have a shoot and a root that comes out of that seed. One of those run into that herbicide barrier that's there and then dies. So it doesn't kill the seed, it kills that super small plant. And because that plant is so small, you don't have to have a lot of herbicide. You gotta have a little bit. The differences in some of the pre-emerged herbicides are some are more volatile, some are more water soluble. I've some, I know when they use on golf courses, the seed can smell it when it's close by and it dies. Like it takes the vapors off of it. But I mean, the vapors only move that far before it dissipates, but that's as far as it needs to go. If, this, if that seed is respiring, it will kill it. But if it is not respiring, then it will not kill it. So pre and post, you got that? This is why we have to get this out before crabgrass emerges. And this is what we have to do afterwards. Now, it stays in the soil for a certain amount of time. And since we didn't put a whole lot on it, sometimes some are shorter, some are longer. I will tell you, I can't remember if I have this later. Has anybody ever heard of pendimethalin or prowl? Yeah, we got one. What color is that? It is yellow. That herbicide was not a herbicide before it was a herbicide. That was a lot of herbicides. It was, now when you get it on you, what's it do? Stains. 
that was actually a textile colorant before it was a herbicide. It was used to, to make clothing yellow and orange before it even made it into the row crop industry. People were wa walking around with pendomethalin on, and so it's very safe. If we're walking with it, it's okay to put it on our soil, especially at the low doses. Then there's what's called selective and non-selective. These are post-emerge herbicides. Non-selective, easy, roundup. Everything it touches, it kills. It is not telling you I can not kill this and kill this. Non-selective. Selective herbicide means it can kill some things you don't want and keep the things that you do want. For example, your fescue if you want fescue in your yard. The reason there's different selectivity is plant metabolism. Fescue can take in that convert it into something else and spit it out. Sometimes it's just the amount that you give it. One spray is good, two sprays is not always better. Okay? One glug is good, two glugs is not always better. That determines sometimes the selectivity, importance of reading the label and putting the right amount into the tank. And then within selectives, or and, and non-selectives, you have systemic and contacts. Contact kills only the, what it touches. So if you spray leaves, it's only gonna kill the leaves. It's not gonna move in the plant. It's not gonna go anywhere. It's only gonna kill those leaves. This is used a lot in sweet potato, sweet potato production. Your potatoes are in the ground. You gotta get rid of the stuff off the top of the ground to get to the potatoes, the vines. You only kill the top, you can rake it all it off, now you can get to the sweet potatoes without having to bale hay and, and get rid of all that. Systemic means it moves through the plant. This is what makes Roundup good. You spray it on the leaf and it moves that all the way down to the root system and helps kill the roots. Some of them are soil plied. The, the roots take it up and it moves it up. Some move it through xylem, some move through phloem, some move through both of them. And that's important, especially with something like Roundup, to follow the label. If you put too much Roundup in a tank, it kills it too fast and never gets to the root. Especially with Roundup, one glug is good, two glugs, you might be coming back to spray it again because it's gonna come back from the root. So really important to make sure you, you go look at the rate, whether it be systemic, contact, everything. A lot of research has been done with all of these to make sure what is recommended on the label is the best to get that control. Because each herbicide label, fungicide label, and insecticide label is going to tell you if it gives it control or suppression. Just because that weed is listed on the label doesn't mean it's going to kill it. It may just say suppression. But then this other side may say control, and it may be a rate response type of thing too. And a lot of times they put them in there as suppression, so you spray it more times, you come by more. That's what you see in the, in the consumer market, because those are typically less percentage active ingredient. So what kind of weeds do you have? Now that we know what the hermicide nomenclature, we're gonna go through the different types of weeds, and then you can know which ones to use for what weeds that are out there. So first one we're gonna talk about is broadleaf weeds. Broadleaf weeds have rounder square stems. What is a plant that has a square stem? Mint. Mint, all the mint family has square. Broadleaf, it's got big broad leaves on it. They can also have round ones. They're, the leaves are gonna be all different shapes. They can be very tiny, they can be very big, but most of the time the veins in the leaves are networked, they're not parallel. The root system, or it can be fibrous, which is just a bunch of roots, bulbous, which is like a bulb, or they can be what's called a tap root, which is like a dandelion. That's why dandelions are so hard to pull up. Because if you don't get that tap root out, it's gonna come right back. So those are broadleaf weeds. Unlike grasses and sedges that have different stems and different roots, um, et cetera, we'll, we'll, get, we'll, we'll get to those. So I'm just gonna go through a couple of these weeds so we know what to identify them, very simple, not going in too deep, but I'm gonna ask you which, what time of year or what would work best for a weed now that we know post, pre, etc. Hen bit, who's got a hen bit? 
It is an annual, but it is a winter annual. It's germinating in September Mar to March. That's a long germinating period. But it's going to flower October to May. What's the best control measure for this? It's a broadleaf weed. So could you use a pre-merge? Yes. And you could also use a post-merge. You can use either or on this. You can pretty much use a post-merge on anything because if it's up, you got to have something to try to suppress it. Common chickweed, just like henbit, comes up at the same time of the year. Easy to identify because it's got those little heart-shaped leaves. Um, it grows along the side of the ground. Henbit usually grows upright a little bit more. The flowers are more yellow or white, where henbit is like a purplish flower. Broadleaf is broadleaf weed, post-emergence, easy to get rid of it, but you could also do a pre. If you were to do a pre on a winter annual, when would you have to put it down? in the fall before it germinates unlike crabgrass which would be in the spring exactly white clover everybody's got white clover the reason i put this up it's not a hard weed to identify everybody knows what clover looks like right all right white flower you got your your um your clover shaped leaf but look real close at the middle of this most of the leaves have a little white ring around them right in the middle, which is important because there's another plant that looks very similar to white clover, but it doesn't have that. And a different herbicide works on this than the other one. So misidentifying, for example, yellow wood sorrel looks a lot like clover, same type of leaves. There is no white ring in the middle. And this typically has a small yellow flower or the, where clover has a big white flower. But if none of them are flowering, you got to go to a different identifying characteristic, which the leaves here. So you can see that it's, it's got, that it doesn't have that, that white ring in the middle. Dandelion. This is the most common broadleaf weed in America, I think. You can identify it from the blossoms, very jagged edges. Not always. I've seen some dandelions that it's more of a smooth wave look than it is than a super jagged edges on the side. It, is, it has a tap root. It's, well, it's hard when you hand pull it up. It'll come back from that tap root if you don't get that root out of the ground. And it's strong too. Has anybody ever just tried to pull it up and it's just ripped off? The only way to get it then is just to dig it at that point because you can't get down in there to pull it up. And it grows all summer long. And it's it's also a perennial. It will come back from seeds, but it will come back from that tap root year after year after year. In the wintertime, it gets brown, just goes to the ground. You don't see it, come back. So would a pre-emerge work on this? Not if they're already there, exactly. There are a, there is, there's always a special exception to everything, by the way. There's like one special herbicide that works really good on dandelions, but don't work on anything else. So it's like it's niche of a kind of a pre. But post-emerge is the best to go when it comes to this one. Now, what time of year? We talked about this. What time of year is the best time of year to get rid of dandelion? Winter, spring, summer, or fall? I don't know why there's two winters there. Well, think about what the plant is doing. Broadleaf herbicide, we got to kill the root. Do we want to contact or systemic? Systemic, okay. So you got to trick that plant and give that plant a herbicide when it's moving energy to that root because you got to kill that root. So in the wintertime, it's hanging out, not doing anything. In the springtime, it's taking the energy and putting it to the leaves. Summertime, it's taking the energy and putting it to the flowers. In the fall, it's preparing for winter. It's taking the energy, putting it back in that tap root for it to come back. So in the winter time, it's still sitting there. So now that you know this, when would you treat it? In the fall, exactly. Here, you still will get some control. And a lot of people see a lot of control at this time because they don't see the yellow flowers. It burns it down and then they come back because you just fed that plant a herbicide that just went straight to the flower and then go to the root because it will move where everything else is going in the plant. So fall is the best time to treat for broadleaf weeds, especially perennial broadleaf weeds. Fall is the best. You move into a house, 
I know we talked about special situations. If you move in, you got to overload of dandelions in the springtime, you might as well go ahead and try and reduce that population and then do another app in the fall instead of waiting and letting them grow and grow and grow throughout the summer. And then you have more of them you have to deal with in the fall. But the best time is the fall, for, especially for, for perennial weeds. This is just kind of an overview. Apply when they're actively growing. We talked about post-emergence is usually best. Remember, a healthy turf will prevent them. When they're actively growing is the same concept of spraying it in the fall. If they're not actively growing, they're not actively taking up that herbicide, so it's not actively going to kill it. A good example of this, and we'll get to Bermuda grass a little bit later, common recommendation is to fertilize water Bermuda grass and then spray it. Because the more it's growing, the more you're going to get that herbicide down to the roots and the rhizomes. And it's probably going to take you a lot more than one application. But broadly, fall is the best. Small weeds are typically easier to control than big weeds, just in general. It's like a mature adult is going to, it's going to be hard to get rid of than a young child, I guess, so to say. I don't know. But it's, it takes more energy to put down a, a large plant than it does a small plant. So big weeds are hard to control. So when they're young and small. With post-emerge herbicides, don't irrigate for 24 hours, which is the opposite of pre-emerge herbicides. You want to irrigate pre-emerge herbicides because you want to move it to the soil surface. Post-emerge, you want it to sit on that leaf and soak in to that plant. When it comes to post-emerge herbicides, no one herbicide works on all broadleaf weeds. For example, we'll just look at the active ingredient 2,4-D. That's a very common broadleaf herbicide in a lot of different products. Common chickweed, it works fair on, sorry. Works really good on dandelions, but works very bad on wild violets. Hardly works. And you come over here to compare list. You got really good control of chickweed, excellent control of henbit, not so good on the dandelions, but it works good on the wild violets. So a lot of times what they're doing is they're mixing multiple broadleaf active ingredients in. Broadleaf weeds, if you have one, you probably got another one too. I mean, just in reality. This also helps with multiple sites of action and, and rotation. So you end up getting a better kill. So it's getting in the plant different ways and then killing that plant even better. So what's out there? Anything with 2,4-D in it is your broadleaf post. There's Weed Be Gone, Weed Be Gone Max. You got any of the Trimec products, anything that says Trimec, anything that says three-way selective broadleaf. There are going to be a lot of different names for these things. You got Weed and Feed, Weed Stop. Millennium, Drive is a good one for some broadleaf weeds, not for other ones. There, so there's a lot of those that are out there. Watch out for the ones that say grass and weed killer. Most of the time, that's Roundup. I look at it and I say, oh, grass and weed killer. I got grassy weeds. I'm going to go kill my grassy weed. Well, it's going to kill your grassy weeds and kill your grass at the same time. So look at the label. This goes with all of them. The label is going to tell you which weeds it's going to go after. So those are the common ones that are out there. And like I said, with broadleaf weeds, don't use just one. This is the standard Trimec Classic broadleaf weed. This is also same active ingredients, same percentages, called a lot of other different things. So look for 2,4-D, look for dicamba, look for those active ingredients that are in there. And they will say broadleaf herbicide on it. And right underneath it, in this little thing right here, in the, on the kind of middle left, it's going to say what it's used for. For residential lawns, post-emerge, broadleaf, and zoysia grass, tall fescue, Bermuda, etc., cetera, et cetera. That's where you go. That's like your abstract. Then you can look at the active ingredients. Then you can look at the weeds that it controls. So, so the next weed we're going to talk about are grasses. This is like your crabgrass, your goosegrass. It's identical to the grass you're trying to grow. That's why they're hard to kill. Very similar genetics in that plant, very similar growth habits. It's very easy 
for a herbicide to select broadleafs between grasses because grasses are monocots, broadleafs are dicots. So there's different mechanisms in that plant. And so broadleaf herbicides only act on dichotomous plants where they will not act on your grass plants. Now that's not saying if you go out and you dump a bunch of broadleaf herbicide on something, you're not gonna kill a grass. Everything has a toxicity level. We have a toxicity level to water, to salt, to things that are beneficial to our body, but if we take in too much, then it's poisonous to us. So just remember that. There's selectivity with them, but too much doesn't kill the weed any faster. So grasses have round stems. They have linear leaves. Very, the veins in the leaves are linear. They have fibrous root systems. They have rhizomes. They have stolons. They're identical to the turf grass that you're trying to grow. For example, you got smooth crabgrass, light yellow appearance, summer annual. When does this germinate? Germinates when the soil's 55 degrees. Who goes out and puts a soil temperature in their yard? <laughs> Mother Nature will tell you when large crabgrass and smooth crabgrass germinate every year without you testing the soil. What would tell you? Red buds? And forsythias. That's a good indicator. If you see your red buds and your forsythias, it's a good indicator. That's the time to put your crabgrass out, pre emerge herbicide out. Be wary of that. Forsythias and red buds that are planted in medians that have the heat from cars and heat from concrete will bloom earlier than the ones in the middle of your yard or the ones closer to your house are going to bloom earlier because they have heat off your brick and heat off your house. So the phenology of those plants are going to be different. But if it's warm enough for that red bud and it's warm enough for that forsythia to bloom, it's probably warm enough for that crabgrass in that area to bloom too. I always pick an area in my lawn that this really thin soil, typically next to the driveway, it's going to get, it's going to germinate there first. That soil is going to warm up because I'm, my car is parked there. It's next to the concrete that absorbing more heat. And so that soil is going to be warmer. Large crabgrass, Sorry, got off topic a little bit. Large crabgrass is very similar to smooth crabgrass. It has hairs. It also roots at the node. The node is just where it bends, you know. Who cares, though? The same herbicides that work on large crabgrass work on smooth crabgrass. But know that there are differences in crabgrass. And it's just due to the hairs that are on the leaf. Now, smooth crabgrass is going to have small hairs, not no hairs. Large crabgrass is going to have these big hairs right at that ligule area. Goosegrass. This is crabgrass's evil twin brother. It is very similar to crabgrass in the seed head that pops up, just, you know, little seed head pods, linear. But the biggest way to identify the difference is there is a wagon wheel white round appearance for, for goosegrass that's not, crabgrass doesn't have. It's going to be flatter to the ground going to look like a little wagon wheel right now well it's not germinated now but in the fall it does some funky things it turns like purple i don't know why i think that's just cold temperatures it's shutting itself down so it, it it's not white anymore so it's just like crabgrass but it germinates a little later it germinates when soils are about 65 degrees later germinating the crabgrass still very similar to crabgrass Later germinating, but it's more difficult to kill. Well, if it reacts to a pre-emerge herbicide, why would it make it more difficult? When are we applying pre-emerge herbicides for crabgrass? In the spring when the forsythias bloom. If this is later, is there going to be a herbicide left to prevent emergence? That's where it becomes problem, more problematic weed. Crabgrass and goosegrass will germinate the entire summer. That's why a pre-emerge herbicide works well because it can be there and get it when it germinates. If it's already germinated and you go out and spray it with a post-emerge, you may have crabgrass a week from there. You killed what's there, but now you have new that's come up. What happens is when you spray the pre-emerge herbicide, it has a half-life and it usually gets below that effective level at later in the season when your crabgrass or your goosegrass emerges. So you typically have goosegrass escapes. 
Goosegrass is a little harder. A lot of times, then what people do is they make what's called split applications. And this is kind of goes along with the idea of why the landscape company wants to do multiple applications. Every pre-emerge herbicide has a half-life, regardless if you put one ounce per acre or if you put 10 million pounds per acre. Half of it's gone in the same amount of time. So if you go out with a pre-emerge herbicide, for Scythias are blooming right here, you put on it, you have effective dose here, right here, you're gonna lose control. It's not enough herbicide on that soil to kill, to stop the germinating of the weeds. So what we like to do is take, instead of putting one big dose on it, you put two little doses on it. Same exact amount, but it's gonna get you further. Goosegrass, if you have a lot of trouble with goosegrass, you really want to look at doing your applications and split applications instead of one big application. So for pre-emerge herbicides, you put it down before the weed germinates. Most of our application timings are due to, for crabgrass because that's the most abundant one. That's why we see the goosegrass coming in later because sometimes our pre's are already gone. Around April, April 15th is the calendar date. I hate saying that. So everybody says, when do I put it down? When do I put it down? It's around April 15th. You guys know way more than I do about the shifts in conditions and time in Kansas. Summer can come super early, so it could be more towards April 1st. It could be super later. You never know. For Scythias and Red Buds are gonna tell you every year. So the calendar date is a tough one to say, but it's at least a good idea that you know in your mind around April, I need to start thinking about this. And so then you look at, look at it. Not only uh, goosegrass and crabgrass, but it also gets your foxtail and sandburrs. Now, sandburr, I wanna talk about this one. This one germinates before crabgrass. If you have a history of sandburrs, you got to put it out before April 15th. You got to get it out there and you definitely then need to do split applications to get you through the summer. So make sure if you do have Samber, a history of Samber, your timing has to go up. But for a pre-emerge, you'll get, you'll get it. There's a lot of different ones out there. Dimension is the trade name. Dithiapir is the active ingredient. Barricade, Prodiamine is the active ingredient. There's a lot that have Prodiamine and Dithiapir on in it, but it's not called dimension or barricade. Or there may be a fertilizer that says spring green up with dimension. So there's a, there's a bunch of different ones that are out there. Scott's fertilizer plus Halts is one, Team is one. Pendimethylin is the one we talked about earlier. It's orange. It's the one that's gonna stain closed. There's about a million names for that one. Prowl, H2O, all sorts of stuff. Like I said, you may get better control with split applications. Some down in April, another app in May, June. Depending on if you use, for example, barricade or dimension. Dimension specifically says four to six weeks after first application. Barricade, I think, is five to seven weeks. But you got to remember, too, you know, if you have high pressure, you may need to go towards the seven weeks or go towards the four weeks, just depending on what that season has done so far. So there's a lot of them different out there. So these, this, and this is an incorrect statement, these prevent weed and grass seed germination. Weed and grass seed, what? Emergence. It does not stop them from germinating. So there is actually um, a study that we have been doing for the past three years looking at depleting the seed bank. If you do pre-emerge herbicides and you maintain or say one year you did a pre-emerge herbicide, you rotated to another pre-emerge the next year, then the next year you just only spot sprayed and cleaned them up, what's it doing to the seed bank? I think once you rotate through one or two or three of them, you end up getting rid of most of the crabgrass that's in your area. Problem is crabgrass will stay dormant for a long time too. So the year you think you got it under control, everything just pops out of dormancy and just goes crazy. That's why weeds are way smarter than we are. So, well, what if you didn't get a pre-emerge out and you got crabgrass? 
There's a product out there called Drive. This is Drive Accelerate. This is Drive 75DF. The active ingredient is quinclorac. Very similar to broadleaf herbicide mode of action, like 2,4-D, but it's really safe on newly seeded stuff, and it works really well on crabgrass post-emergence. Now, the problem is, it's a weird type of efficacy for it. It works on baby crabgrass, not teenage crabgrass, and works on old crabgrass. Teenage crabgrass fights it off for some reason. I don't know what it is. So when crabgrass emerges, then it gets into about this one tiller stage. Everybody know what a tiller is? Fancy word for a stem. Crabgrass emerges, puts on, have a stem, it puts on a leaf, another leaf, another leaf, another leaf, and then it puts on another stem. That's your second tiller. So you got to get it before that first tiller or wait till it has four or so tillers on it if you didn't get your pre-emerge out. But if you're up in this area, you're early in the year. So if you just add a pre-emerge herbicide with it, then you can get control for the rest of the season. If your stuff is five tiller or more, it's probably waited too long to put a pre-emerge down. So then you're just gonna have to do your herbicide application a couple times to get rid of it. This is why it's important to identify. If you had goosegrass and you sprayed this, it ain't gonna do nothing. It ain't gonna do nothing at all. So if say you had crabgrass escapes, you know drive works, you know that this product can be applied and it is effective, now you gotta go look at your crabgrass and see how many tillers do I have on it. Because if you spray it in the three tiller stage, you're wasting money, you're wasting time. So you just wait for it to get up here and then you spray it and get rid of it. Crabgrass, I've mentioned this, germinates throughout the year. It is very, very hard to go out and say, yep, I'm in a three tiller stage. Because if you're in a three tiller stage, there's probably some that are in one tiller and some in four tiller. So you have to look at it and get what the majority of a population. I just go out, all right, this square foot, pull all of them out of that square foot and just kind of count the numbers and get a general idea. That's going to be generally what's going on in your yard. So don't blame your herbicide if it doesn't work. You may just be applying it at the wrong time. It's a real finicky product. I've sprayed it on one side of the yard on leaf stage stuff and it's worked really well. On the other side it was leaf stage and didn't do anything. So just be very finicky. It's just a very finicky product. But if you have goosegrass, not gonna work at all. So making sure that you identify goosegrass from crabgrass is real important. The last type of weed we're gonna talk about are sedges. And this will get us to a good break point. Sedges have edges. All right, that's the way to identify them. They look a lot like grasses. I mean, linear leaves, they grow fast, but they have a triangular stem. So if you take this and you cut it, and you cut it and you look down it, it's gonna look like a triangle. The easiest way is just roll it in between your fingers and you're gonna feel that, that, that it, has, it has edges. The predominant one that we see in Kansas is yellow nut sedge. If you start getting more southern, they have what's called purple nut sedge, which is even tougher to control than yellow nut sedge. More southern too, and even towards the Wichita area, there's another uh, sedge, it's called Kalinga. It grows really low to the ground. It has a very nice fresh scent, but it spreads like crazy. And it's a very difficult one to control too. But mainly here, luckily, luckily we only have to deal with yellow nut sedge. Like I said, triangular, triangular stems, linear leaves. The tubers are these huge giant nutlets or giant seeds that are in the ground and they're all connected to one another. That is like a huge seed that can germinate from feet under the soil. It can stay dormant for decades and they're smarter than we are. Who's went out and pulled the, this plant out and came out the next day and there's more? Yes. This plant rip it off, spray it with herbicide, whatever it is, it sends a signal over here and says, we're under attack, get to growing. It's exactly what it does. And because these tubers are big, it means it's gonna take a lot more energy to kill it. It has the energy to grow from deep in the soil, different types of soil, sandy soil. I did a study at Auburn University, we looked at the emergence depth of a lot of different weeds. We have these big columns of soil. They're about a foot wide. And we put about a foot of soil in. 
put some tubers and then fill the rest of it up, go up about two feet, do the same thing all until we got up to the soil surface. Everything we put in that five foot tube came out the top. So, and I know they'll go dormant for a long time too. So this is a super, super, super tough weed to kill. I mean, just by the biology of the plant itself. It's a perennial, it's, way, it's later germinating or sprouting than, than your crabgrass and your goosegrass. A lot of times it pops up, we have spring rains, we have you know, more rain during the spring, and it, you see it sometimes then, but then it just kind of dwindles, doesn't do much. And then when the afternoon thunder showers hit, here comes the yellow nut sedge. Just that little bit of water it needed to break that dormancy. Stata grass, it likes just about everything. The main herbicide is called sedge hammer. Sedge hammer, can't sedge for sedge hammer, all right? It requires a sticker or spreader. There's a new one now called sedge hammer plus that you do not need the sticker agent that goes in it. You know, these are, they won't injure the turf and it won't injure any of your turf. This is a sedge only acting herbicide. You know, by mid September, nut sedge starts to go dormant, so you got to get it in before then. Multiple applications with a lot of these things. One is not always going to do the trick, even with your broadleaf weeds. Tread it at the, what the, the labeled rate that it says, wait two, probably four weeks, and hit it again. Slow death is sometimes a better death. We got to get it down to the tuber, down to those rhizomes, injure it, and then do it again because then it's going to shoot up more. Sedge hammer is not as systemic as another product, and I don't know if it's in the packet or not, called Dismiss. Dismiss is um, another one that actually moves and gets into the tubers a little bit better and can actually kill some of those tubers that are in the soil. The active ingredient in it is called sulfentrazone. S-U-L-F-E-N-T-R-A. Z-O-N-E. I can't believe I remembered how to spell that. Yeah. It's going to be in a lot by itself. It's called dismiss. It's still on patent, but you can get it in a lot of other products that are out there. So sedge hammer works well. It's not as systemic. It does move, but not as much as dismiss or sulfentrazone. A lot of different products with sulfentrazone in it that are out there. I did mention this, and I do want to mention it again. Grass and weed killers may kill your yard too. So look at that active ingredient that's in it. So this is when someone went out and spot sprayed Roundup on their weeds because it was a grass weed and it ended up killing their grass that's around it as well. To finish off the weeds, Roundup is a non-selective herbicide, but we can make it a selective herbicide. If a plant is not growing and it's not taking it up, is it going to kill it? Winter warm season plants not growing are doing anything in the winter when it's dormant. Are there weeds in the winter? Is fescue maybe in there? Some other grasses, winter weeds, perennials? They're still metabolizing. So what you can do with the Roundup, and this is glyphosate only, Look at the label. Most of the products I saw, I went to Home Depot the other day, and I was just, of course, I'm a nerd. I go to the herbicide section, just look around. They have glyphosate and something else. Make sure it only has glyphosate in it. Only. Don't get it with anything else that might be in, in that bottle. So what you can do is you've now selected for that actively growing weed in a non-actively growing Bermuda grass, buffalo grass or zoysia grass. You want to do it on a warm day because then the other plants are, are metabolizing and actively growing a little bit more. Not warm enough to get the Bermuda grass, the zoysia, or the buffalo going, but you can spray it and clean up all that stuff. Roundup is cheap compared to a lot of other products. Must be 100% dormant. Get down in there and look around. Make sure there's no green coming up in it. Right now, we're getting about to the end of that window in Kansas. We're gonna start warming up and stuff is gonna start greening up. You don't wanna spray it if there's any green whatsoever in it. 
Also important, if you're spot spraying, you don't have to put so much on it that it's dripping off of the plant. Just a quick pass right over top of it is all you need. What happens is, say there is a little green in that Bermuda grass, in that zoysia grass or buffalo grass, if you put a lot of it on it, it's going to drip down to the crown of that plant. That is green because that's going to be the first thing that greens up, and now it is soaked it in. You killed the weed, but that's going to be now delayed to green up in the spring. You won't kill that plant, but you will delay the green up by a week or two. And then it kind of looks like, kind of looks like this when it greens up until that recovers and grows back in. So it's a pretty neat way of making a non-selective a selective just by knowing your turf is dormant as well. So for that, you don't have to do anything. This is another question that I get. Control of cool season grasses and warm season turf. We just talked about you can spray the Roundup in the warm season to get rid of it. There's not really a good option to really get selectively when it's actively growing. You know, we said you can do it when it's dormant, um, early spring may be better than late fall. Warm season is more likely completely dormant at that time. Late fall, that warm season grass may not have completely hardened off for the winter. It may not be completely dormant yet. So wait until it's completely dormant to do those types. There are some other, thing, other things that you can do selectively wise. Applications. And I don't know if I have that listed, but we'll get to it. So Bermuda greens up and goes dormant early. One of the other things you can do, other than spraying, sorry I got distracted there for a little bit. One of the other things you can do uh, before you start spraying is just mowing your turf at the right height. If you want to minimize Bermuda spread, go up to the highest mowing height that you can with your fescue. Go up to that top three. Don't go to the two. Go up to that three. Because Bermuda grass likes to grow sideways, tall fescue likes to grow up, so you're, you're helping that one plant outcompete the other plant. I did a study, we put little bits of Bermuda in the tall fescue and just monitored how much it spread. And just mowed it at different heights. Sorry, this is in metric, but that's one inch, that's two inches, three inches, and four inches is all it is. By the end, 80 weeks after we put a five inch by five inch plug in fescue and just mowed it at different heights, the one inch was 80% Bermuda grass. The three and the four inch only got to 12% Bermuda grass. It didn't kill it, but it slowed it down. So just like the crabgrass was talking about, if you mow your grass and you have a little bit of contamination, you're gonna slow that movement of that Bermuda grass within it. Perfect example, that's one inch on the top left of how the Bermuda grass really took over, and then you can still see some in there, but we didn't rip completely get rid of it at four inches. So it will slow it down. There's a couple other ways, non-selectively. We said selectively, you can spray it when it's dormant for Bermuda grass. Systemic herbicides need to be applied when it's when? Growing. When's Bermuda grass growing? Midsummer. Give it some water and give it a little fertilizer and get it growing. Then you apply your, your Roundup. Then you probably have to come back and hit it again. Cut it low, you know, get some of that dead material off, actually promotes new growth, and you're going to kill the new growth now. May take two, three applications, but this is going to be a non-selective application. Just multiple applications of Roundup. Then you're going to have to reseed into this area. You're not, you can't save any of your fescue or anything that's there. You have to reseed. Late August, spray again with Roundup if anything is green. That Bermuda knows it's going dormant and knows it's injured, so this is the last dagger. You get that last little bit that sends it down to the roots, down to the rhizomes, and really, really translocates it down, down to uh, those reproductive systems and then come in and seed on top of it. That is the best and cheapest way of doing it. This may mean that you might have to kill part of your yard and it be brown for a little while. Let me tell you a little secret. Go buy you some turf paint and put it in with the Roundup and paint it green and no one will know if it's dead or not. <laughs> and then seed right into it, you know? There's a lot of turf paints out there. You just mix it with a little bit of water. It's not regular paint. It's, it's made for turf, 
you go to the website, there's also some professional ones too.